So I don't know about you guys. Do you guys know what this is? And you guys have the same one. Yes. I had forgotten my, my sunscreen, and Dennis brought this for me. Nice guy. And uh, I guess this you spray on, so the sunscreen. But uh, what does sunscreen do? What do you it keeps you away from the sun. Keeps you away from the sun. Yeah, so it blocks the sun's rays from well, what happens if you didn't wear sunscreen? It would burn. You would burn, yes, yeah, for sure. If you're out on a hot day with the sun on there shining, you'd get red skin from being burnt and all that kind of stuff. Wow. So what do you do? How do you use this? What are you supposed to do? You spray it on yourself? Okay. So do you think it would be okay if I just kept it in my pocket? Would that protect me? No? What? Why is that? Yeah, it's, so it's not on me. That's right. That's true, right? Because I'm just carrying it. I mean, it's just sitting in my pocket. I actually put sunscreen on last summer, so I should be pretty good for this summer, right? What? But I, it was, it's not quite a year ago I put it on. I should be good now, right? Sunscreen's good for a year, isn't it? No, no, no. What do you have to do with sunscreen? You put it on just once a summer? Every summer, so like we only do it once this summer and then next summer. Oh, so read the label, tells you how, I like that, read the label and tells you how many times I'm supposed to put it on. And then that means that I have to put it on at more than once in a day, right? Yeah, I'm not going to read that. That writing's getting smaller and smaller, so. I've hit that point, guys, where I'm like, where is it? Anyway, so, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Maybe that works. But I, I have to wear, I have, if I'm out all day in the sun, I should put it on, like, when I go out, and then I have to do it again, and I have to do it again. What happens if I only do it once? I'll get sunburn. It wears out, right? It wears out. It, it loses its strength. Well, I want to tell you that we have to apply our faith not just once in a while, not just like, hey, I did, I went to, I, I did this to help my faith like a year ago. I'm good. And we can't like, you know, have our Bible sitting on like a bookshelf saying, well, I own a Bible, so I should be good. I understand everything in the Bible because I bought it and I put it on a bookshelf. We have to open up the Bible. We have to use it. When we, when I talk about how we have to strengthen our faith, we have to apply our faith, what it means is that we have to do things on a regular basis that build up our faith. Just like sunscreen is used on a regular basis when you're outside, builds that protection, we have to do things like, what kind of things can we do to build up our faith? Praise. We did that at church today, and, we, and I, I really love that. That always gets me. Pray. I do that. I do that all the time. Do you guys pray? Yeah, good. Uh, what else? You're in a place right now, which is a pretty good. Go to church. Yes. Wow, you guys are good. Um, how about reading the Bible? Is that a good way? There you go. That's what you were going to say. But what about hanging out with our, our Christian friends, the people? Who, yeah, they help encourage us and all that. We have all sorts of ways to strengthen and build our faith. And it's not just good to know what you're supposed to do. You have to do it, right? There you go. I have a verse for you, and it is uh, Romans 10, 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So when we come to church and we sing the songs that talk about God, and when we read scripture from the Bible like we've already done today, when we pray, when we hang out with our Christian friends, when we do all this kind of stuff, it builds our faith. So I'm encouraging you, don't just do it once and walk away, but remember that we have to, just like with the sunscreen, do it on a regular basis. I'd say do things every day, right? Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you. 
for this reminder that our faith is an, an important part of our lives, but that it needs to be strengthened every day. God, we ask that you give us hearts that hunger to hear your word and that we hunger also to worship you. We thank you for our church. We thank you for our church family who help us grow in our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, before the kids take off, I want to remind them that we're not doing children's church. The children's church has a break, but we do do clipboards during the, during the summer. So I'm going to ask you to go to Anna, who's sitting at the back. Grab your clipboards, but then sit with your families. And then after the service, bring your clipboard back to Anna. There we go. So at this time in our service, it's a time for the sermon. I'm usually getting my notes here and ready and all that. But we have the pleasure of having Don Hume with us. Uh, he's going to be preaching. You know, I was asked once uh, if it's intimidating having retired pastors in the, in the church. And we do have two. Terry Gowdy is here. He's a retired pastor, Don Hume. And I got to tell you, it's not intimidating. These men have always been an encouragement to me uh, as a Christian, as a man, but also as a pastor. They uh, uh, are always praying for me, always offering support. And so I appreciate them. I love them both. Uh, and I'm so glad that they are a part of this church, so glad that they're part of my life. So come on, Don. Thank you. My technical ability, I turned the mic on. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, we don't have central air in our house, so I find this fairly comfortable in here today <laughs> so, compared to what the week was like. Let's pray. Dear Father God, we pray for your guidance, wisdom, and direction for our lives, that we may be obedient to your authority and fully place our faith and trust in you. As you instruct us in the scriptures, not to worry about what to eat or drink or what to wear or tomorrow, but to seek first your kingdom. Dear Lord Jesus, as these worries come into our minds, may we quickly recognize that this is not your will for us. As you care for the birds and the flowers, you will care for us as well. May our faith always remain unshakable in you our Lord of Lord and King of Kings. I pray all this in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know what you think, but I believe there are three states of mind that are affecting people today. Probably I always have, but it seems to be talked about more and more right now. The first is anxiety. But as believers and followers of Jesus Christ were instructed in Philippians 4.6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. The second is fear. Have you ever heard the acronym for fear? Anybody know? False evidence appearing real. Once again, Joshua 1.9, we read, This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. As I said, I believe there's three mindsets, anxiety, fear, but today I'd like to focus on worry and stress. Do you think they're related? When you worry, do you get stressed? When you're stressed, do you worry? I used to own a bakery. We had delivery trucks. And I can remember many nights worried and stressed about whether the storms would clear up or we'd be left with all this product loaded on the trucks and the trucks couldn't even leave town. Was this, I wouldn't sometimes wonder if I still have PS, what's it called, PTSD. I wake up in the middle of the night, I think, oh, that's years ago. <laughs> I would worry and get stressed. The more I stressed, I'd worry. I wish I hadn't known the Lord better at that time. It probably would have relieved some of that. Our scriptures we'll be studying today come from Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34, as well as articles and commentaries from Jeff Strife, Mark Souffle, David DeWitt, Vern Crothers, and Steve Shepard. You might wonder why I say that. I had an instructor 
when we went through Houghton College, and he warned us that if we didn't give credit to where we got the information, we'd get a big fat zero. I don't think we got any zeros, but <laughs> he threatened us. You know, there was an old sea captain quizzing a new crew member to see how he'd fare at sea. What steps would you take if a storm came from the starboard? Well, sir, said the new member, I'd throw out an anchor. What if another storm sprang up in the aft? I'd throw another anchor. What about a third storm came up on the forward? The young man said, I'd throw out another anchor, sir. Just wait a minute, Captain, said the captain. Where are you getting all these anchors? Well, I'm getting them the same place you're getting the storm. The Bible tells us in this world, it will be filled with storms. Our lives will be filled with storms. Great faith-filled men and women of the Bible faced many storms. Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son Isaac. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. Moses confronted Pharaoh and led the Hebrew people out of Egypt. David faced Goliath. Daniel faced the lions in the lion's den. The Apostle John was beaten and kept in a Roman prison. Even Jesus warns us that life wouldn't be easy for those of us that follow him. As Jesus said in John 16, 33, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Take heart because I have overcome the world. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a prophet. But I almost feel certain if you haven't gone through a storm in your life or are not going through one right now, you're going to go through one at some point. That's my problem. You can laugh at me, okay? The Bible tells us there is one thing we must do. Jesus tells us in the midst of storms, we must not worry. We should not worry. Matthew 6, 25. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? This statement, I believe, is the key to our spiritual growth and our personal fulfillment. We should honor God and center our desires on him, and we should be content with what God is doing in our lives, even though at times it is uncomfortable. And it is uncomfortable. Is this implying that we shouldn't desire things to improve? Of course not. Of course not. But that should not be our first desire. We're to be content. There's a difference between what we need and what we want. Isn't that true? Have you ever noticed that line between needs and wants has got somewhat blurry? I grew up in a home with seven. Three of my brothers and myself shared a closet now, it's not that I came out of the closet. But shared a closet. <laughs> it just falls out sometimes. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'll understand if you don't want me again, Chris. <laughs> we shared a closet in a small bedroom. Did we have lots of space? No. Today, if you don't have what? An ensuite in every kid's bedroom, they're deprived, right? What is the difference between wants and needs? Wants and needs. Jesus often instructs us as to be content, not to worry. Psalms 55, 22. Give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. God wants us to give our burdens and worries to him. Trust in the same strength that sustains you to carry your cares, your worries also. And in the New Testament, in 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Have you noticed that a lot of the scriptures that deal with anxiety, fear, worry, and stress are the same? Because they all point to the same person, Jesus. Amen? We're to give him all our struggles. So the scriptures say, I'm not to be worried or stressed. But pastor, you don't know the pressure I'm under. You don't know the pressure I'm under. My car needs repairs. The roof needs doing. The kids need money for school. And the list goes on and on, right? But the Bible tells us not to worry or get stressed in the middle of challenging times. Wow, do I feel better now because the scriptures told me. 
just because I read these scriptures and it says, do not be anxious or worry about anything, does that mean everything is better? All our problems are gone, solved or disappear? Yes? I don't know about you, that's not my case. We all worry to some extent, don't we? Finances, children, health, the future. But there are three problems with worry. First, worry is unhelpful. Worry is unhelpful. It never accomplishes anything. It's like riding a rocking horse. I'm trying. Come on, help me out a bit here. You go back and forth, back and forth. Worry can't change the past. Worry can't change the future. Right? Second, worry quite often exaggerates a problem, never minimizes them. Worry can make your mountains out of can make mountains out of molehills. How many of you have ever had a headache? Oh, so there's a few. Okay. Have you ever worried that it could be something worse? Have you ever worried? You know, that stress just grows. Has your worry made any difference? No. Possibly it's made it worse through stress and worry, right? Thirdly, worry is unhealthy. Our bodies are not made to worry. Our bodies are not made to worry. It can cause physical ailments, high blood pressure, doctor's appointments, ulcers. I know someone whose gums get inflamed, inflamed when they worry and stress. Dr. W.C. Avery, a stomach specialist, says 80% of stomach disorders that he treats are not organic. Most of them are caused by worry and fear. And Dr. Alex Carell states that people who don't know how to fight worry die young. The old English word for worry is the word to struggle or choke. And that's what worry does. It chokes the life out. Worry chokes the life out. Jesus does not say we shouldn't live our lives without concern, nor does he say we should not live our lives without personal effort. But what Jesus does say is that we cannot allow the concern to take over. We cannot allow our concerns and worries to short circuit the work of God in our lives. Amen? We're not born worrying. We've learned to worry. We're not born le worrying. We've learned to worry. So why does the person worry? Why does the person get stressed out? Let's look at the basic question. Why do I worry? Why do I stress? The answer is very simple. We worry and get stressed out because something has happened that we cannot control. Something has happened that we cannot control. Like no rain or too much rain when the farmers are trying to hay. I'm trying to buy some hay for our donkeys right now, and he tells me it just hasn't been a good season to get good hay yet. We worry because something happens and we can't do anything about it. We can't change it. We can't fix it. We can't alter the situation. I had a brother who lost a leg to an infection about three months ago, and, you know, he has said to me, maybe if they had to get on to the medication quicker, maybe it wouldn't have happened. But he's coping okay with it. He's coping okay with it. He's not walking with the Lord. I'm hoping he comes there, but he is coping okay. He can't change the situation. He realizes that. He just has to deal with it. Corey Tenenboom, the great evangelist and one of Pastor Chris's favorite heroes of the faith, once said, worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Matthew 6, verses 26 and 27. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you far more valuable than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? What Jesus is saying here is that worry is worthless. Worry is worthless. It doesn't change anything. Every day has trouble. Every day has trouble. Even as Christians, surprise, surprise, you can't avoid trouble. You can't avoid trouble. But worry doesn't help. Remember the rocking horse? You're all going to be going home doing that? No? And so we need to get it off our plate, out of our minds, remove it from our consideration, and we need to stop worrying sooner, not later. It does us no good. It does us no good. So one reason we worry is because there are situations we cannot control situations we cannot control. 
Another reason we worry is because we spend our time supposing. Supposing. You know, suppose this happens. Suppose that happens. I have a brother-in-law like that. It drives me crazy. It drives me crazy. Get the facts, and then we'll discuss it. It's the story of a faithful Christian woman who didn't have a lot of money, but she was always cheerful and smiling and excited, just like everybody here, right? Don't you love being around people like that? Don't they just make you feel good when you're around somebody that's excited like that? We as Christians should be all that way. The ones others want to be around because of the joy and the cheerfulness that radiates from our relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Well, this Christian woman was so cheerful that a friend decided she was too cheerful and needed a reality check. So her friend said, I know you're always happy and smiling, but your approach to life is unrealistic. You don't understand how, large, how hard life is. I mean, just suppose you got sick or were unable to work or suppose your company closed or you lost your job or suppose all of a sudden the Christian woman said, stop and said, I never suppose. The Lord is my shepherd, and I know I shall not want. Amen? When we know the Lord is our shepherd, we will not want. Years ago, I was having a similar, similar conversation with my accountant. I said, what if this? What if that? What? He said, stop. Let's get the facts first. Well, that was before CR came knocking on the door. Some people don't. Matthew, Matthew 6, 34. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Planning for tomorrow is time well spent. Don't get me wrong. Planning for tomorrow is time well spent. Worrying about tomorrow is time wasted. Worrying about tomorrow is time wasted. Worries. Worriers are consumed by fear and find it difficult to trust God. They let their plans interfere with their relationship with God. Don't let worries about tomorrow affect your relationship with God today. Don't let your worries about tomorrow affect your relationship with God today. Worrying is a faith issue. And I hate to admit this, but I've been known to worry. Be anxious. Be stressed out at night. But right at the end of verse 30, Jesus asked, Why do you have so little faith? Well, in Matthew uh, 6, 30 to 32, we read, And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. To sum this up, it simply says, why do we have so little faith? Why do we worry? Because our Heavenly Father already knows our needs. Worry is when we put more faith in our problems than in God's promises. Worry is when we put more faith in our problems than in God's promises. That's why many scriptures stress looking to God in the midst of our difficulties and worries. Psalm 62, 8 states, O oh, my people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. You see, the Bible tells us God is the doctor for my doubt, the antidote for my stress and worry, the fix for my lack of faith. So knowing that truth, how do we hold on to God in the midst of our doubts, worries, and stress? How do we hold on to God in the midst of our doubts, worries, and stress? Jesus says back in Matthew 6, 22 and 23, it's a matter of what we look at. It's a matter of what we look at. Your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your body is good, your whole body, when your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if, light, if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. If we focus on worry and doubt, our eyes will grow dark and our whole body gets full of darkness, right? It's a mindset. It's a mindset. Serving God is the best way to repel that darkness. A good eye is one that is fixed on God. 
When you and I get bogged down with worry and stress, we need to look around and look at what God has done in the past and bring that to our mind. Pay attention and realize what he's already done in our lives. In Philippians 4.4 4, we read, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Our ultimate joy comes from Christ dwelling within us. That's how we repel darkness. That's how we repel worry, doubt, and anxiety. We look at what God has already done and know that he is always there with us. In Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9, Paul goes on to say, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then God, the God of peace will be with you. We need to rejoice on the things that God has already done. Take a look around. And when we rejoice in these things, worry and doubt and anxiety will be driven back and replaced by the peace of God. Amen? So the first thing we can do to confront worry in our lives is to change our focus from our problems to God's promises. From our problems to God's promises. Second thing Jesus tells us to do in Matthew 6, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. What does it mean to seek something? It means to hunt, to search diligently. A few weeks ago, I lost my phone. And aren't most of us so attached to our phones? You know, for work, whether emails, texts, whatever. Well, I searched diligently and eventually found it out beside a bush somewhere. It must have fell out of my pocket when I was out there. It was a bit of a tense time thinking of all the contact information that could have been lost. Jesus wants us to search for him with that same diligence. He wants us to search for him with that same diligence. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I look up to the mountain. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. My help comes from someone who can do it all, who leave our worry, our doubt, our fear, our stress, and our anxiety. As Jesus states in Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30, then Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Rick Warren, who's sometimes called America's pastor, the author of The Purpose-Driven Life and The Purpose-Driven Church, has said that worry is a warning light, that God is really not first in our lives at that particular moment. I love that line. It doesn't mean that we are away. It means at that particular time, we're not putting him first in our lives. Because worry says that God is not big enough to handle our situation. That's what worry is really saying, that God is not big enough to handle our situation. The antidote for worry, fear, and anxiety, stress, and doubt is this. Put God first every time. Look to him first every time. Go to him first when you are worried. Go to him first when you're fearful. Go to him first when you are anxious or in doubt or stressed out. As verse 33 states, seek the kingdom of God above all else and relive, live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Amen. May God richly bless you.